I just want to welcome all of our viewers on this Friday. Uh, beautiful day here in Northern Virginia, but we're really excited to have uh, some of our uh, favorite members and leaders from ALEC uh, in Arizona on the call with us today. We're joined by Senate President Pro Tem Vince Leach, uh, who chairs our Tax and Fiscal Policy Task Force at ALEC. And shortly, we will also be joined by uh, our National Chairwoman, uh, Senate President Karen Fan of Arizona. So the topic today, we are beginning our special countdown of the top three states in the latest edition, the 15th edition of Rich States, Poor States, which the new rankings just came out a few days ago on tax day. One of the biggest stories was that Arizona had a huge jump this year, going from 13th place in the 14th edition to its current spot of number three overall for economic outlook. We've also got uh, Alec Executive Vice President of Policy and Chief Economist Jonathan Williams with us, who of course is one of the co-authors of Rich States, Poor States. Jonathan, I'll turn it over to you. Well, thanks Lee and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I was just uh, really excited to be able to have this countdown series that we're having this year with the new launch of the 15th edition of Rich States, Poor States recently. And so we have some incredible success stories over the next number of weeks that we're going to be discussing, uh, starting with number three today in Arizona. Uh, next time we'll have uh, our friends from North Carolina at number two. And then finally countdown to number one, where we'll have uh, the great state of Utah represented for 15 years in a row at number one. But as part of this discussion, we're gonna be talking about some of the states like Arizona and North Carolina nipping at the heels of Utah and uh, potentially threatening the Utah number one ranking in coming years due to some of the very free market reforms that we're gonna talk about today. And so if you've seen the new national news, uh, with the real threat, I think, of stagflation that we've been warning about uh, now for months uh, with those horrible GDP numbers of negative 1.4% uh, loss of economic growth uh, here, as well as the uh, just uh, insidious inflation of 40 or 50 year highs that we're seeing of over 8%. Uh, and now with some calls in Washington, D.C. to uh, surprisingly, uh, with a straight face saying that we need to raise taxes in order to get inflation under control, uh, Washington once again proves what I always call it, the land of make-believe here. Uh, but to contrast with that, uh, we wanted to talk about some of the states doing things so well, like Arizona. And so we're very pleased to have our good friend, Senator Vince Leach, with us today uh, to talk about um, how Arizona was uh, the real winner from the 2022, the 15th edition of Rich States, Poor States, moving from 13th to number three in economic outlook, an incredible jump forward. Uh, so Senator Leach, uh, how did you do it? Well, you know, Jonathan, th well, first of all, thanks for having me. Uh, when I joined the legislature in uh, 2015, we were ranked number five uh, and we bounced around number five, number eight uh, for a couple of years. And I always looked at those as, as, it, as it came out and, and said, we need to be higher. And we, we were reducing taxes. Uh, we reduced taxes every year uh, that I've been here. Uh, along with Governor Ducey and the legislature, we've, we've reduced some tax somehow, somewhere. Um, in, 2000, uh, in 2011, uh, we had some tax, we had some uh, bad year there uh, as far as our, our ranking and in 2000, um, 2020 wasn't much better. And then just when we think we're gonna really jump on this and do something, we fell in a, in a bucket. We fell in more than a bucket. We fell into a, into a well, a, like a bottomless pit. And as you said earlier, we went to uh, position number 13. That was, uh, that was because we had a, uh, uh, a voter initiative. We have voter initiatives in this state uh, that was going to really, in effect, have a 77% increase on higher level incomes. And that, uh, that didn't bode well with the authors at uh, Rich Stage Poor States. And we took, uh, we took a, a, a big hit. As I said, we went to number 13. Um, that January, it would have been January, actually December of, uh, of, of 20, 
and going into uh, January of 21, uh, the House and the Senate were meeting, and we were also meeting with staff of the, the governor's office. And we talked about our, our economy was, was coming back, our economy was strong, and how could we make it stronger? And, and one thing we, we all zeroed in on independently, collectively, was that we needed to reduce a personal income tax. And, and I remember the governor saying, big. Well, big is never defined. Uh, but we went on our merry way, and in uh, uh, later that year, we did in fact pass, pass a uh, flat tax rate. Uh, it was a struggle. Uh, nonetheless, we had to do a lot of things uh, to to get there. We had to benchmark it over years, uh, so we will be fully there in 2025 at a two and a half percent flat tax, lowest in the country lowest in the country. And at the same time, uh, we reduced uh, uh, the assessment ratio on businesses. We have this funny tax system in Arizona that we, we break our, our different types of uh, real estate into different, different uh, rankings. And uh, businesses at one time in Arizona paid 25% where residential paid 10%. Uh, and so we started at the same time we did this flat tax, we also did a reduction in the uh, uh, assessment ratio that over two years would be down to down to 16%. When, and when you look at the drop from 25% over the years down to 16%, and we just passed a bill and the governor signed to get us to 15 uh, by, uh, uh, let me see, that would be by 27. So we took a number of steps in that particular area. Uh, we, uh, uh, the, the ballot went through, the ballot measure went through, it would have been a 77% tax increase. Uh, the courts came back and said, that's an unconstitutional uh, initiative uh, because it would uh, put more money into schools than what we have called an aggregate expenditure limit. It's a formula by which you measure how much you can put in school by uh, population, uh, inflation, and student growth. Uh, and so it'd be way over. The court said, no, uh, you can't have that. Uh, we started working on a, uh, and also, so we passed this, we passed this uh, uh, two and a half percent flat tax. We also have an initiative process that the voters of Arizona can take anything we pass and send it to the ballot with the correct number of signatures. And they did that uh, and they got the number of signatures. It would have gone to the ballot in, in here in 22. And the court just said, oh, golly, it had been a week ago yesterday, the court just said, the Supreme Court said, you can't refer something that has to do with taxes in the budget. Huge win, uh, our two and a half percent tax uh, bracket is locked in. And we're all smiling and cheery. <laughs> and life is good in Arizona. That's a great, impressive story. And there's a lot to unpack there and a lot of hard work that went into that, certainly from you. And as we'll hear in a minute from President Fan, and I know Majority Leader Thomas has talked to us about this at some of our other ALEC events and just a great uh, confluence of free market leadership uh, because it wasn't easy, right? I mean, there was uh, as many people that don't follow Arizona politics day to day, you know, don't realize perhaps that you have a one vote margin in the Senate and a one vote margin in the House, at least for Republican majorities versus the Democrat caucus. Uh, and so, I mean, it was an incredible amount of, as Trent Lott, the former uh, Senate majority would say, uh, herding cats probably to get things across the finish line. Is that accurate to say? That is, that is very accurate. And so we had to do some, we had to do some things uh, within the budget uh, to, uh, for example, we have state shared revenue in the state of Arizona. So by reducing the amount of income that we had coming in, that would necessarily reduce uh, monies uh, to cities, towns, and counties. Uh, and so they were camped on our porch and they had a couple of supporters that made, uh, uh, made the trip to signing this bill rather arduous. Uh, and and to, to overcome that, we basically changed the formula. It went from 16 to 18 uh, percent that would make them whole. It, in essence, and in fact, 
the monies uh, the monies that cities were asking for were way over and above that our cities and towns in the state of Arizona are flush with cash, uh, not only from ARPA and from the CARES Act, but things have been very, very good in the state of Arizona. We also uh, worked on a Wayfair bill, and this all ties together in, in, a, in a package to where we are today. We passed a Wayfair bill that, that helped our, our cities and towns uh, reap some of those uh, sales tax monies that were going to other states that wasn't being collected. Uh, so we went to 18%. Uh, uh, that was arduous. I will tell you, I was in those. I was in those rooms. That was very arduous and took more than, more than more more than a couple of hours. We're talking days to get to that particular point uh, in in the process. Senator Leach, uh, I got a I've got a comment and then a question for you. But um, I think you're well aware of this. But with the recent developments of Arizona moving to a flat tax this year, you're in great company of three other states across the country that have also moved to a flat personal income tax. Uh, of course, Iowa being one, Georgia and Mississippi, all moving to a flat income tax this year. And believe it or not, uh, in the first 110 years of states imposing personal income taxes, only four states uh, prior to this year in 110 years had gone from a progressive tax to a flat tax. We added four more. We doubled that number this year with Arizona being one of them, uh, which is incredible. So the question I have for you though, uh, one of the things Jonathan and I talked about um, around the time that that Prop Proposition 208 had narrowly passed in Arizona, um, you know, Arizona since 1992 uh, has nearly, $12 billion in annual adjusted gross income that's come just from California. You're the largest uh, recipient of new residents from California behind just Nevada and Texas. Um, how have you seen that play out? What importance do policies like this play in attracting residents, not just from California, um, but from other states across the country and the region? Pre COVID. Um, so let's, let's talk, uh, 19, uh, and early, uh, 2020 Arizona was, uh, receiving 300 people a day into the state. I don't have any post COVID numbers because I don't know, first of all, if anybody can decide what, when co post COVID really is, but we were getting 300 people a day that moving has not stopped. If you ever want to do a, a little fun thing. Uh, check the rates of uh, a U-Haul uh, from Chicago to uh, uh, Phoenix and from Phoenix to uh, Chicago. You, they'll almost pay you to take it back to Chicago because people want a U-Haul to come out. Uh, people are moving here. Um, I'm surprised, but I, I'm concerned. Uh, the last uh, unemployment numbers that came out uh, a week last Thursday, uh, showed us at a 3.3% unemployment rate. Um, I'm, I'm worried that's good on one side, but I'm worried on the other side, we simply don't have enough workers. Uh, and people are not, not, uh, not coming out. And I don't think it's because of, of wages. Uh, I think it's, I, I'm not sure what it is, but I don't think it's wages. People are, are complaining about how much they've had to increase. I was with a group of small business spend NFIB on, on uh, Wednesday. And they all complained about not being able to find people. And they all complained about not being able to find goods to sell. So obviously we are an attraction. Uh, it's interesting that you talked about the four states uh, that uh, collectively have gone to a flat tax. Uh, I use that uh, in, in, along with Senator Mesnard and, and Representative Toma when we were crafting this program, I said, one of the things we're doing is we're not only giving money back uh, to the residents of the state of Arizona that have worked so hard. We had, I don't want to call it excess money. We have simply ripped too much money out of the hands of our constituents that it was time to give it back uh, rather than put it into programs that don't work, uh, duplicate, whatever. And so uh, I said, we need to, we need to jump ahead. 
we're probably not going to be to a zero tax like many states are, uh, because right now we're running too many side programs off in income tax. But I said, we've got to put ourselves in a more competitive position so that the people flying over us actually land in Phoenix or land in Tucson or land in Flagstaff uh, to, so we get a chance at that business. Uh, that has happened. That is happening, and we're going the semiconductor that came in from Taiwan. Uh, we have uh, we're leading the nation in electric cars. Uh, Nikola is a huge truck manufacturer that will be running on uh, that will be running on hydrogen, uh, and they're all landing uh, in Arizona, uh, and they're all landing <laughs> for the good of Arizona. They're at, not only in Maricopa or Pima County, the two big biggest counties, they're landing in, in smaller counties where there is a, a workforce ready to go. But let me talk about the target because when we were in a dilemma deciding whether or not the court was going to let the challenge go through and we wouldn't get the, the two and a half percent flat tax, we were talking about some, to make it easy, a repeal and replace to change something and just pass another one. Um, and we were getting some pushback on that uh, uh, from members that had voted for the bill last year. And our comments were, other states have taken a look at us and the flat tax. We were the first one out of the gate and people were coming after us. Now that we're there uh, and, and we've got to get that back, uh, and I, I would believe, I don't know, you guys track the other states closer than I, but I would believe other states are looking at that. When people have a 2.5% tax, I came out of Wisconsin when we retired in 2007, 2008, and I think our, our highest rate was 6.5%. But they're going to lose people uh, because they're just not, not going to put up with those with high taxes, and they're not going to get the benefits uh, that they think they should for six and a half. I know I wandered a little bit there, but there's a lot, lot to talk about. But putting your target on your back, that after you sit on the floor of the Senate and that's members of the House doing the same, and you pass something like that, you don't go to the hammock and say, we're done. Because, you know, uh, because first of all, we have to catch Mr. Stuart Adams in Utah. And second of all, we have other states that, that see us growing and they want a piece of that business so they can employ people. That's a great point, there. I mean, uh, one of the, I think, great takeaways now from 15 years of rich states, poor states in our research is states, to your point, uh, Senator Leach, can absolutely fall behind by standing still. And so especially when you're in the top 10 or the top echelon of states, um, there's a lot of movement that even somewhat small policy changes can move your ranking a number of spots. I mean, you, though, in uh, 2021 uh, enacted one of the most historic tax reforms and net tax reductions in recent years by dropping the rate. And as we've talked about, I think it was, what, a nearly 20% uh, decrease in overall you know, revenue, right, uh, was the, the forecast, and moved from 13 to 3. And, and as a result, anybody that you surpassed in uh, North Carolina and some others in recent years, maybe they didn't do anything bad, but they did fall behind uh, because you guys were leading the way. Now, I just, as you know, came back from Topeka, Kansas this week, where we were with uh, Senate President Ty Masterson, and you know, we were talking about Kansas and where they rank, middle of the pack now. Iowa, as Lee referenced, was one of those four states that became flat tax states, taking their uh, top uh, marginal rate in the past, over 8%, now down to a phase in of a flat tax under 4%. So just incredible, nearly you know, having the tax burden, on at least the income tax rate. And there's absolute pressure that that is putting on Minnesota and Wisconsin and Illinois and Missouri and, and Kansas and Nebraska to keep up with the Joneses, so to speak, in the neighborhood. Uh, and so that's an important component. But speaking of Kansas, it's, a, I think, a really important segue to, I think, one of the most uh, probably misunderstood, uh, misreported, 
uh, potentially uh, on a, an intentional basis by the progressive media out there. But the, the saga around the Sam Brownback tax cuts from about a decade ago <laughs> in Kansas, that if you've gone anywhere in recent years, that will be argument number one by those that don't actually have a policy argument against tax cuts to say that it ruined the state of Kansas. Of course, that's a it's a straw man fallacy. The real problem in Kansas and in, in very short terms, which could take a whole policy hour to describe, the, the short answer is Kansas increased spending by hundreds of millions of dollars while they were cutting taxes. And as we all know, in a, in a balanced budget environment at the state level, where 49 of the 50 states have balanced budget requirements, that's a no-go. So talk a little bit about how you were able to overcome arguments like that, because I know that argument came up, as you and I talked many times in the debates around Arizona, that Kansas was you know, a, something that we need to be worried about. But what were the other big arguments and how did you overcome them? Well, I, I, on the, on the uh, Kansas issue, I, it was, in fact, it was at an ALEC meeting, I think, when I first, when I, one, of, one of your presenters talked about, uh, you know, you, you have to, if you're going to cut taxes, you've got to cut spending, or you've got to have spending, you've got to have relative income coming in uh, to replace that. And so I simply said, very plain words, I said, uh, to, I, I remember the gentleman I said it to on the floor, I said, you have to read the back of the book. Because the back of the book shows you what what happened and why it happened, and and, and if you cut, uh, if you if you reduce it and give tax relief, uh, you, you still have to make it up. I, in Arizona, we have been so blessed. Uh, I mean, right now we're sitting with three billion dollars of one-time money, and and a billion dollars of, of ongoing money. So what? when we look at that and you sit down across the table from some of our own members and certainly those members across the table uh, on the other side of the aisle, he said, this is just wrong to put this all into government, to hire people, to run programs, as I said earlier, to, to expand what we do. We're doing quite fine. We're growing, growing, growing. We're generating wealth. Our GDP is holding well, although I'm concerned about the numbers that, that you talked about earlier. We're growing and we're growing and growing. And I get before groups all the time and I said, we're simply taking out of your billfold, out of your checkbooks, out of your credit card, too much money. And we need to put, put it back. And we would tell that to the, to, the, uh, to the Democrats and we would tell it to some of those in our party. Now there's always wants and wishes. Uh, for example, the homeless uh, issue, which I'm getting more involved in, and I think the Republicans have to fix it. But you have to make sure that we don't put money into programs that haven't performed. How much money? Uh, look at Colorado. I just saw a report this week, for example, from Colorado. They spent about $100,000 per homeless person in the state of Colorado. And in government, they have one person for every homeless person, that 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 dog doesn't hunt for very long. You just that when, when that gets exposed, now what we're trying to do. In fact, we're down. Uh, I think fourteen or fifteen. We're down about five thousand people uh, working uh, in, in in state government, and I, I would foresee probably that number is going to go down as we're having more and more people work, work from home, um, which I'm have mixed emotions on, but, but that's, that's some of the things that, that we did uh, and we um, and, and shared with our members. Uh, we're simply collecting too much money. When you go into a budget meeting and if my fellow uh, senators and representatives from Arizona are, are watching, you know, one of the things we have to do is we have to hide money because if you don't put it into paying down pensions and you and I, Lee and, and Jonathan, we've talked about that. We put a billion dollars into pension. We put a, a, a billion dollars into roads. We put a, a, almost a billion dollars into buy and buy buildings. And so we, we showed that we were spending, but we were spending those areas that actually gave us return on investment. Yeah, those are, I mean, great points in that you paid down debt, you did all the responsible things to avoid a scenario where you overspent like Kansas did and then ran into problems in the future. Uh, but, you know, the uh, one other question I had for you, Senator, is, 
you know, what were the impacts of, let's say, working with outside groups on this, the, the free market infrastructure that's been developed around the country, whether it was Alec or our friends at NFIB uh, or others that, you know, were very kind of the helpful with the research that was out there as you put together this package and really knew what was going on in the other 49 states as a result. For those that don't know, uh, Jonathan and I, during that time, we were on the phone almost every day uh, comparing notes and, and getting, uh, and you, you folks did uh, a tremendous job at all levels. Just It just wasn't one person. It was from top to bottom that were helping us out, not only with phone calls, not only with working with people, but also publications and also right from the top. I know uh, Lisa was involved in, in phone calls uh, I will say that uh, uh, the uh, uh, Americans for uh, Americans for uh, Arizona Free uh, America Arizona's for uh, Prosperity they were they were big on it. That's a local organization. Uh, Goldwater was big on it, uh, and so you had just a number of people. Um, uh, Arizona uh, Americans for Tax Reform. Uh, they were there. It, it, it just you just put out the call uh, because this was, as you, as has been said, and and sometimes I think we're too close to it to realize the magnitude of what it was that we were trying to do. Uh, but certainly people on the outside did, and they were willing to jump in, not only with phone calls but documents that we could use and showing where it would go and and, and helping us uh, paint the picture uh, of. Uh, of you know, when you talk about tax reduction, um, the other side just gets their the hair on their neck up right away because they have spots suspended. So we had to break some of that down. Uh, we, they didn't vote for it, by the way. They did, the, the Dems didn't vote for any of this. But we had members that were concerned about the size. It was, overall, it was uh, a $2.9 billion a tax reduction. Uh, I didn't mention uh, earlier that we also in that tax package uh, removed uh, uh, taxes from our retired military folks. Something we'd had it on disabled folks, but on military folks. So the outside help was, was tremendous. Uh, either documentation, phone calls, um, person to person visits, it's huge. And, and you sh we should avail yourself. I've never been afraid of, of calling the, the Alex of the world or Grover Norquist. Although Grover's, Grover's comment was classic. And for those watching that know him, you know, we go into two and a half percent, walked into a meeting and he shook my hand. And he said, when are you going to zero? So, <laughs> you know, he just wants to get rid of it all. Anyway, hope that answers some of your question. Absolutely. That's very helpful. And, you know, certainly appreciate all of the great Alec, you know, partners and allies, like you mentioned, from NFIB and AFP to ATR and others that just all came together with that kind of research and analysis that could be helpful to help get things across the finish line. But it took leadership well, well, from Jonathan, like you and President Fan uh, to really make it happen on the ground. If I could just add something along those lines, you know, uh, prior to my time here, uh, and certainly now, uh, you know, Alec has had a strong presence in Arizona, not a physical presence, but but uh, certainly influence. And we've always sent a, a, a very good number uh, back to the various meetings. And so we are we are trained uh, in the Alec philosophy. And so when when Alec or groups like Alec, particularly in the tax area, come forward with plans and programs, you don't have to sell who Alec is, what they do, how they do it. And are they are they reputable? Uh, we are people that are at the table and ready to absorb uh, as much as we can. I wanted to shift gears, Senator Leach, with a, a question about the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. You recently had a resolution that mirrored a new ALEC policy, urging Congress to extend uh, the tr the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act of 2017, there's 23 provisions in that relating to the individual income tax uh, that are set to expire at the end of uh, 2025, as well as um, the provisions relating to the cap on uh, SALT deductions. So I wanted to get your thoughts there and why that issue is so important to you. 
as a state legislator. The uh, the TCJA Tax Cut and Jobs Act was the was one of the springboards, if not a main springboard, uh, on on really getting Arizona going. Uh, we were a little Johnny come lately to the uh, to the enormity of TCJA. We didn't uh, we didn't conform uh, that first year, and it caused a little bit of confusion in the in the in the taxing arena. In fact, we actually went forward in 2017 without, we, we, we conform, we're one of the states in, in, uh, in America that conforms to uh, the US tax code. We did not conform. So there was no formal uh, conformity or not conformity going forward. Uh, and I'm not sure how our Department of Revenue handled that. Um, but then we did conform in 2018, uh, that saving, savings was what has led us to, we merged something together to uh, reduce the number of rates uh, on our income tax side, and then also introduce a uh, wayfair to, to cushion what, what may have been, many thought would have been payments out to cities and towns for uh, state shared revenue. None of that happened. Uh, we, did get, we did get the reduction in rates. Uh, and none of that happened on the cities and town side, and it just added to, added to our income. I, I mentioned on the floor because I did run that resolution. I'm kind of, that, that's now been approved, right? That model policy? It has, you say, shaking yes, your head. Sir. Yes, Yeah. Uh, and if you're still in session, I would, uh, I, I would recommend, recommend you to do it. I, I, I uh, in a comments before and after, on running that, I said, one of the biggest things, because people, I don't think people in Arizona, uh, basically a low tax, low property tax state, understand how much we were paying for high tax states, like the Illinois and, and New Jersey. Uh, and it took Steve Moore, I think three or four times to, with a piece of paper and pencil to show what was happening with uh, state and local taxes. Because as they were able to, those states were able to deduct more, uh, that put more sh the burden uh, on, on us uh, as, as smaller states, smaller uh, 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 income states. And so I said, that's one of the main things right there. And plus, you're going to have humongous tax increases on top. I don't know if you saw the numbers for Arizona, uh, which just came out. We, we had the highest inflation in the country, 8.5%. Um, inflation rate. And by the way, also, I saw a cartoon this morning. So in the middle of all this inflation, we're going to get rid of the cheapest light bulb there is on the market, the incandescent light bulb. I thought that was a, a little shot over the bow. But uh, uh, yeah, it's very important. Uh, I think I caught some people by surprise that, it, that, that, that we ran it. I talked about it in caucus, obviously, and everybody was for it. But I think uh, coming out this far in advance sets the stage, uh, not only for now that people are talking about it, but it also sets the stage for, for our congressional candidates uh, that are running uh, in, in 22, uh, certainly in 24, uh, to, to start taking a look at this and, and get a jump on it so that we don't go backwards. Well, that was such a, uh, that was such a important Jonathan, Jonathan, if I could, I want to make a point that, that, that you mentioned about if you stand still, you're going backwards in this, this environment. This, and that's what happened. Uh, that's what happened to us. And I mentioned this at the beginning. That's what happened is from 2000, uh, 2017 uh, to 2010. And then when they had the, so we didn't, we, we had some tax reduction, but it wasn't, it wasn't anything meaningful. It was more, we checked the box that we had tax. And so we were, we were just kind of holding our own and people started catching us. And that's why we, we didn't drop down. Uh, we were just beat out. Yeah, that's, Sorry, that's such Sorry an important interrupt. point. Um, and, you know, you had the ballot access where you had uh, voters pass uh, anti 
small business minimum wage increase that hurt Arizona's ranking there. And of course, then the, the teacher union funded uh, <clears throat> Prop 208 there that caused the problem with the income uh, tax increase uh, on a temporary basis that hurt Arizona's ranking. But, you know, back on the Federal Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, I mean, I think you being the first state out of the gate to go on record saying to Congress, uh, something needs to be done here, especially now given the, just the historic inflation, these negative GDP numbers, the real threat of stagflation for the economy. Um, this is something I think is essential. I mean, a lot of folks forgot it because of some very complicated Senate rules. Uh, we, we talked about this with the Bush tax cuts 10 years ago. Remember, this was in the news uh, during the Obama administration is these things phase out over time if nothing is done. And so by the end of 2025, all of those individual provisions Provisions that you uh, and Lee have been talking about go away, including the smaller, the lower individual rates, the small business uh, lower rates, the really the hated AMT, the alternative minimum tax comes back into full force as it was prior to the Trump tax cuts. And then as you pointed out, the, uh, the SALT deduction goes back to unlimited from the current $10,000 a year cap, uh, really bringing back that subsidy to high tax states like California and New York and New Jersey and Illinois. Uh, and this is something as you know well, Alec, uh, and uh, alongside uh, your old colleague, Debbie Lesko, now a member of Congress, uh, really helped lead the way on that effort to say this is bad policy. And this was something that uh, a lot of folks don't know this, but we uncovered a, a video from the 1980s where Ronald Reagan said that was my unfinished business from the 1980s tax reforms. It was a full repeal of the state and local tax deduction because he realized how big of a problem it was for good public policy. But let me just um, say one thing as we kind of close out here here, Senator Leach, and this has been an incredible conversation. I know that many are listening live, but even more will watch this in the days and weeks ahead, is what do you, in kind of in summary, what do you tell a legislator that's looking at 2023 ideas, perhaps, realizes that their tax rates are well above what they need to be for the region or just overall for competitiveness? Uh, it, how do you do it well? And what was your experience in short? And should they go ahead and, and be aggressive next year? Well, you have to, you know, you have to keep one, one or one and a half eyes on the rearview mirror and to see in your particular state uh, what what inflation is going to do uh, to to the to the marketplace. We're in a we're we're in a position uh, maybe different than many states, certainly different than the northern states. Uh, we have a draw. Uh, we had a draw from the beginning before taxes, and, and we have a draw for because of our weather. Uh, you can do a lot of things here. So we have a, a, a draw right in. So states that have to fight against us, uh, Wisconsin, where I came from, uh, you know, right now it's, I talked to our son last night, it's in the 30 degrees and rain and snow. Uh, but, but look and, and do, some, do some hard searching, uh, line item by line item. That's what we have done uh, the last four years. We went, kind of went to a, a, a different budgeting schedule uh, in the in the Senate and the House, uh, we we started, and rather than just look at what agencies said and put it in, uh, we went through each agencies. We had all the agencies in uh, that that presented their presentation to the governor, presented to us, and we asked them particularly, why do you need this? What could you could you do it over two years? Could you do it over three? And what we were found what we found is that. We were able to combine fleet cars, for example. We were able to combine that. We were able to combine maintenance. Uh, we were able to combine building usage. And the one thing that, that, that I'm not first in, but the one thing that we were able to start working on combining was cyber protection. We had cyber protection in every silo in government. And as you know, Governments are great on forming their own silo and not like, but we had people paying insurance, different insurance rates for different uh, protections on cybersecurity, where we have the Department of Emergency and um, uh, Emergency Management uh, that can really handle everything. Now, tearing down those silos and getting one department to run everything is, is kind of a battle. And obviously the universities and uh, our universities and community colleges aren't, are, they, they think that they're special and have, and, and to some degree they are, they have um, uh, things that, that are, uh, um, that they have that they need to protect. But we've, we found that all those things 
all of a sudden you could save a dollar here and you could save a dollar there. And we went in with not a cutting, but just being um, efficient in what we were doing. That led us to look at pensions. And it was at a, Matt, we were at, where, we were at a uh, Reagan ranch uh, where I remember asking uh, some folks, and I think Jonathan, you were in that discussion, you know, what would happen if we paid down, what, what is the best way to reduce pensions? And we said, cut it down. When we were able to show our members, and maybe this will help other members in other states, that if you paid down X number of dollars, you're going to get good return on your money because your, your pension debt accrues at the assumed rate of a return, which in Arizona is at 7.3%. So we're, by putting that six, $700 million down, uh, well, actually a billion and two, we were picking up about 300, uh, 300, just about 200 million a year in return. Uh, so that, and as has been said about pensions many times, that's a that's a unappropriated uh, expense uh, that's going out there. So um, get the fine tooth comb out. Don't throw things out, but see where you can cut. And then have this have this uh, uh, opinion, have this idea in the back of your mind that uh, you're you're always there for the taxpayer. That's what I tell my my constituents. Very well put, Senator Leach. And just want to thank you again for the discussion today, the conversation, and congratulations again on the number three ranking in the 15th edition of Rich States, Poor States. Um, it's, it's really exciting to see what leaders like you have been able to accomplish um, just in the last uh, year or so in creating more opportunities for the residents of your states. We look forward to being joined on the next webinar uh, in our countdown series by our friends in North Carolina, where we'll talk about their number two ranking in our latest report. Uh, and on behalf of the ALEC team, just wanted to say, hope everyone has a great weekend and we will talk to you soon.